Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mark Pinto here with you from Phoenixville Public Library. And we are pleased to have with us today, George Dillman, who is the Consumer Outreach Specialist from the Pennsylvania Department of Banking and Securities, delivering a presentation about banking in the 21st century, how it works. You know, banks have been in the news lately, as you folks knew. Uh, so George is going to enlighten us on just, you know, how, how things work with the banks, how your money is protected and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, we are recording the presentation for our YouTube channel. And if you have questions, please hold them till the end of George's presentation. Uh, and at that time, you can either unmute yourself to ask or type your question in the chat. Uh, unfortunately, George, or, or fortunately, George is having video problems today. So you won't actually be able to see him, but you'll be able to hear him pretty well. So thanks so much, George, and go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, welcome everyone. And yeah, again, my apologies. I'm not sure, you know, if it's on my end, my apologies for no one being able to see me. Uh, but welcome to my presentation on banking in the 21st century. As Mark said, my name is George Dillman, and I'm the Consumer Outreach Specialist with the Pennsylvania Department of Banking and Securities. This is what we're going to be covering today, the differences between online banking and virtual institutions, the pros and cons of, and considerations for virtual banking, things to remember no matter what type of institution you choose. We're going to talk about the types of institutions, but before that, just a just kind of a, a little history on on banking. Banking has has been around in some way, shape, or form almost as long as as civilization it, itself. Um, it, it goes all the way back to the time of the Greeks and the Romans, and even further than that. But maybe some formalized uh, form of of banking has been around since the time of the Greeks and the Romans. As uh, a lot of us know, most of us know, they, uh, it, it, they, they worship multiple gods, and all these gods had their own temples built in the cities and towns that people lived in. These temples were, were well-staffed and well-guarded, and the, um, the temples had a lot of wealth themselves, and wealthy people of the towns or, and cities uh, at, at some point started storing their wealth in, at these temples. And probably getting charged some, and not probably, but getting some charged some type of fee for that to store their wealth there to be to be protected. At some point, the especially the coinage started to, to be loaned out, paid back with a with a special type of interest, and that's kind of how banking got started. And of course, through time, we now have uh, the institutions that we have today. So we the types of institutions. We, we, we're looking at basically traditionally, and I'm, I'll come back and explain what I mean by traditionally. We're looking at three types of institutions, banks, credit unions, and savings banks. The, the differences between, you know, banks versus credit unions and savings banks um, owned, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, held by stocks, you know, stockholders, uh, owned by stockholders. Uh, lar generally larger institutions than the, the, the credit unions, the savings banks, offering a more, uh, uh, again, traditionally a larger array of services, dealing, uh, dealing more, catering more to commercial uh, customers as opposed to the general public, and, and uh, going back to the whole stockholder thing, because they're answering the stockholders, uh, they, they, of course, they need to show a profit. So they need to, you know, the they charge fees, and and they got to watch what they what they pay in in interest to to account holders. Um, flipping over to credit unions and savings banks, generally uh, member owned in a lot of cases, even with the savings banks member owned, uh, catering more to the general public to their members because they're member owned customer service generally is better, maybe a lot better in certain cases. And again, because they're, they're owned by their, their members, they're catering to their members, they, they uh, better rates as, as far as what they're paying out and what they're charging for their customers. More and more, I think we're, we're, we're starting to see a graying of those areas though. 
you know, we're seeing like uh, banks becoming more customer service oriented, starting to offer more competitive rates, credit unions and savings banks starting to, to offer a larger array of, of services for their, for their customers. Uh, in some cases, maybe not even not being as customer service oriented as, as maybe other, other uh, entities. And I'm going to use my own situation as an example. I, uh, I have an accounts with a large regional bank. And, uh, and I also at one time <laughs> had accounts with a, with a large local credit union. And I ended up moving my accounts from the credit union to my large regional bank because with that bank over the last 10, 15 years or so, customer service has really increased, has really gotten better customer service with that credit union was little to nil, little to nothing, if, if you will. Um, so I, I, I made that move. Now, I'm not saying they're all that way. Uh, I'm just in my particular case with my particular credit union I was working with, that's what I saw. So I, I think what we're looking at more and more is a graying of these areas. And, and, and maybe, you know, if we're looking at, an, uh, uh, at opening an account or moving accounts. It might come down to looking at the individual institution itself as opposed to the type of institution. But for in some respects, the, the, the type, you know, they, they still, they, you know, they still have their, their separation. But again, I think we're seeing more and more a, a graying of these areas. And, and the note down at the bottom says these institutions can be vir virtual or traditional. And we're gonna talk about that. Uh, online banking versus virtual banking. Online banking, uh, where we're conducting banking transactions online or through an, uh, your institution's mobile application or website, there's a connection to a physical location of the institution. If you need to, you can go into a branch and speak with a live person. Basically, we're talking about online banking. We're talking about the traditional brick and mortar banks with an online presence. And as we, I think, as we all can see, that online presence is start is continuing to grow, and grow. Uh, however, because we're we're dealing uh, with a, in most, at least in most cases, with the traditional brick and mortar um, banks or credit unions or savings banks, we still have those physical branch locations that we can go into, at, if and as we we need to to do that. So online banking versus virtual banking or virtual institutions, where the institution is strictly on a virtual platform. Transactions are online uh, or through an application. There is no physical location. If you require assistance, any conversations are by telephone, chat, or even through social media. So virtual banking, uh, basically strictly online. Uh, there is no uh, traditional brick and mortar branch locations to, to go into. Everything is either done online, over the phone, through social media, so on and, and so forth. Pros and cons to that. The pros, they may offer lower monthly fees. They might not have any overdraft fees. We'll talk more about overdraft fees because more and more of, of your larger institutions are starting to do away with those. Uh, or, or lower those, but may not offer overdraft fees, uh, may offer higher interest rates on, on savings. Because they're, they're, they have a virtual presence only, they don't have any uh, brick and mortar uh, buildings to pay leases on, to heat, to, to, you know, uh, to you know, electric, they don't have to, to uh, you know, pay for electric, they don't have to pay salaries of, of staff to, to man these buildings. So, uh, a, a lot that they can pass on to the customer because they don't have any a physical location. The cons, again, no physical branches, uh, less access to, to live help. Cash may be hard to deposit, may offer less one-stop options. Some or, or, or maybe a lot of your virtual online uh, institutions may only offer some type of a savings option and not much else. I think they are starting to add to that as a whole, but uh, but uh, individually, some of them might only offer you know very very basic services. So so that's that's the uh, the drawback, if you will. 
Some people, I've seen this more and more, some people are taking advantage of both. The traditional brick and mortar uh, uh, institutions as well as the virtual institutions. Having or keeping their accounts with their, their uh, brick and mortar institution, but opening an account uh, or accounts with a virtual institution to take advantage of those, those much better rates, those savings rates that uh, in some cases can, can be much higher than what we're getting at our, our traditional locations. Uh, they, they do offer standard institutional services. Most line, online institutions offer those standard features you would expect from a traditional, from a traditional institution. Access to ATM machines, uh, accessibility, where you can access your accounts and services using the internet or your mobile device virtually 24 seven, which is a good thing. Security, online um, institutions with regular security measures are considered as safe as, as brick and mortar institutions. So we, the, the, we don't have to worry as, uh, you know, about our, our money maybe not being as safe because of that. What we do have to watch out, a lot of institutions now with the, these money transfer services like, like Zelle and Venmo, I've been reading more and more uh, about scammers taking advantage of this, and and you know people getting scammed and scammed into into uh, sending money from their account to another account. Uh, basically, it's almost like handing over cash, and somebody tricks you into thinking that you owe them money, and you send and you send that money, and may, even an hour later realize that you were just scammed. It could be difficult to get those funds back, so we got to be careful with that. But the standard security measures should be just as good. All right, types of accounts, and I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about savings accounts. When I say savings accounts, we're we're looking. I'm kind of both balling them all together under savings accounts, but we're looking at, when we're looking at our savings accounts, we're looking at checking savings, money market accounts, the holiday slash vacation clubs, and certificates of deposit. Now, for me, there's a little asterisk there, because many of your institutions now are starting to branch out into, uh, into an investing options as well. We have to be careful. My large regional bank is doing that. We have to be careful. Uh, Mark and I were talking beforehand about uh, savings versus investing. Uh, I'm with, say I'm with ABC Bank and I decide ABC starts an investing arm and I decide I want to invest some of my funds and I move some of my funds over to the investing arm. What we have to, to remember uh, at least with most institutions, and we'll talk more about this later, most institutions, uh, our savings, again, balling this all together under savings, our savings is insured. Even though we're with the same institution, uh, because we, we're dealing with their investing arm as far as investments, our investments are not insured. When it comes to investing, our money is insured. We're, we're basically taking a risk when we're we're investing uh, investing money, so we have to we have to remember that even though it's with the same institution, I'm with ABC Bank, and I and I have savings that are insured up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars. If I have investments with their investment arm, that money is not insured. So, a lot of them though, you know, starting to uh, offer this as a, basically as a one stop shop. Everything from soup to nuts as far as what we can do through our institution. Likewise, you have the what I what I refer to as the big box investment companies doing the same thing. Many many or most of them offering uh, basic savings options as well as their as the investing options. And again, whether it's a bank or an investment company, it's all about you know a one stop shop for customers. So opening an account. You're opening a new account. Uh, what are your needs? Do I do I need to have that brick and mortar location? I personally, I again, I'll use myself as an example. I might go into my local branch uh, once or twice a year, but I like knowing that it's there in case I need to go in there. That that it's there to use. I'm going to be doing that today. Uh, the one once or twice, you know. But I, it, you know. So what are your needs? Do I need to have that brick and mortar? Uh, 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 
institution branch to go into to use. Could I, can I do everything online? Can I go with a virtual? Uh, do I need more than just basic savings options? So, you know, what are your, your needs? Fees and features. What kind of features do, the, do they offer? What fees are they, they charging? Different institutions are going to charge different fees, different amounts. And maybe one reason why people like to shop around and maybe find a better deal, if you will, when it comes to that. What are their identification requirements? That might also tie into security. Uh, what about all those disclosures? This is something we probably should be aware of. We currently have uh, 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 accounts with an institution. Uh, institutions make available disclosures, basically discloses everything about that institution, how they operate, what they do, how they do it, what they charge, how they charge, why, how they make charges. You know, something like uh, fund availability, which we're going to be talking about shortly. You know, when I put money into, into my financial institution, when are those funds available that I can take them back out? Uh, write, uh, if I still write old-fashioned old checks, when, when can I write a check against that money that was deposited? Could be important. Ask questions uh, such as, and again, fund availability. Institutions, depending on the institution, you may have some or maybe even all of your funds available to use. I, I deposit, whether it's automatically deposited, I deposit, um, say I deposit a check for $500, but I need to, to again, I do say I still do the old fashioned checks. I need to write a couple checks against that money that was deposited. Depending on the institution, I may have to wait up to five business days uh, before, before the, the, those, those funds are available to use. So that could be important, especially, and I'm going to talk here, and we're going to talk a couple more times about this as far as what's coming in versus what's going out. I do a presentation on spending plans or basic budgeting, you know, and, and budgeting basically is just monitoring what's coming in versus what's going out. And the whole idea is to make sure we have more coming in than what's going out. And if we, if we do that, we should never have a problem with fund availability. If, if, I'm con if I have constantly, if I constantly have more money coming into my accounts than what's going out of my accounts, I may need, never need to worry about what is available, but for a lot of people, you know, living paycheck to paycheck, dollar to dollar, whatever's coming in is going out, that could be, that could be very tight and, and that could be an, a, 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 an issue. That could be a, could, could be a concern. And, uh, and maybe a reason, maybe I switch from ABC uh, Bank to XYZ Credit Union or XYZ Bank uh, because maybe my funds will be available sooner, quicker for me. You know, are your deposits insured? Uh, not, all, uh, not all institutions, your money is insured. Um, most, inst I would say most institutions, your money in banks is FDIC insured up to $250,000 and NCUA insured through uh, credit unions up to $250,000, but not all are. Maybe uh, good to check into, you know, with, if you, you know, with your current institution, just to make sure that your money is insured. Um, and that could be big, you know, of course, what's, what's going on right now, that could be, uh, could, could be an issue uh, in, in some cases. And what fees might I be charged? Again, Different institutions will charge different fees for different things, different amounts. And if you're not happy, if you're getting, you're, you know, you, you got fees here, you know, left, right, and every which way, and you're tired, you, I might want to, to shop around and, and find, uh, find an institution that may offer a better deal as far as that goes. Ask your institution how they process transactions, largest to smallest, or in order of receipt. Again, this can be important for somebody who's living paycheck to paycheck, dollar, dollar to, to dollar, uh, and, and, and it could be tight with those funds. Again, how do we alleviate that? We, we, we look at budgeting. We look at, you know, what can we do to free up additional funds uh, to, you know, either make, make some cutbacks, uh, uh, you, you know, either make sure we uh, look at, at maybe more money coming in. Maybe I look for another another job 
and I get another job and I'm going to make, I'm making an extra $200 a month. And I decide I'm going to take down, I'm not going to spend that $200 a month. That's the $200 that I'm going to, I'm going to have extra coming into my accounts to build my accounts up. Something else I talk about uh, is, uh, is, is uh, you know, short-term funds slash emergency funds, which is what we should be using our savings accounts for. And, and, uh, and having a nice, healthy, short-term slash emergency fund. Experts say that we should have at least at least three to six months worth of expenses in a short-term emergency fund to cover those short-term needs and or those emergency needs that are going to come up. Not if they come up, when they come up. So if, again, if I'm living paycheck to paycheck, dollar to dollar, what can I do to make some cutbacks? Even if, it, even if I free up an extra 50 to $60 a month, if I have an extra 50 to $60 a month, more coming into my accounts than what's going out my accounts, I'm building those accounts up. And again, I may not have to worry about how, uh, how those the transactions are, are processed. But again, for those of us that are, are tight, and this could, this could have a factor, you know, largest to smallest or in order of receipt. Here's the example that I use. I have uh, five bills that need to be paid. I still do the old fashioned uh, checks. I have five bills that's, that need to be paid. The, uh, the first four bills are for $100 each. I have $400 in my account, maybe a little over $400 in my account. The first four bills are $100 each. I pay those bills first and get them, and get them sent out. I wait on the last one. The last one is for $400 total. And even though, even though you know, with, with those first four bills, I'm basically wiping out my account. I'm figuring, well, this is gonna be received last. This will be processed last. I'm gonna take a hit. I'm, I'm gonna have an overdraft on this. I'm gonna take a hit on, but I'm it only gonna take a hit on this, on this one bill. I take care of it. Not knowing, it goes out, not knowing that in my particular case with my institution, my institution isn't, isn't processing in order of receipt. They're processing largest to smallest. So all five of those bills come in, and even though that, that one for $400 came in last because it's the largest one, gets processed first. That gets processed, there's no funds in there to, to cover the other four bills. The other four bills don't, they, they bounce. And, and I may have to pay a fee for all four of, 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 those, of those bills. So again, that could be important for some people, how transactions are processed. So maybe something to look into. Uh, what overdraft op options they offer? Because I think most, if not all institutions, offer some type of overdraft protection. So again, if I'm, especially if I'm living dollar to dollar, I may want to take advantage of that. And, and what are the fees for an overdraft? I've heard fees of anywhere from $25 to $40. Although recently I've read several articles that especially your larger banks, some of your, at least some of your larger banks are starting to lower those overdraft fees or eliminate those overdraft fees. <laughs> Although on the flip side, I've also heard that <laughs> read that the that the you know they're 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 adding those fees someplace else. So <laughs> so they're eliminating them from the overdraft, but putting them someplace else. But but still, uh, they they're either lowering or doing away with overdraft fees. So who knows? And some time at some point we might not have to worry about that. So what is an overdraft? An overdraft happens when more money comes out of your account than is available. Overdrafts can be expensive. Uh, they can charge for each item. Again, I could get whacked twenty-five to forty dollars for each one of those four bills that uh, that weren't covered, and and they could charge fees until you make a deposit. Yeah, until, until you make a deposit. Now the fine print down there again says check those disclosures. It's all specified there. Again, those disclosures. I think I've mentioned this before, but the institutions, every institution should offer a disclosure about how they operate and they, those disclosures should be made available to customers and potential customers. So you can see how they do, you know, how they are, how they're charging, what fees they're charging. Avoiding overdrafts, uh, you know, know your balance, know your balances, make, make, you know, 
sign up for text or email notices. Uh, check that deposits have cleared. Again, uh, fund availability, have deposits cleared. Review statements and balance accounts. And again, I'm going to add this at least one more time. The other thing that we, what we thing that we can do is make sure we have more money coming into our accounts than what's going out of our accounts. Again, that whole budgeting thing, monitoring what's coming in versus what's going out and freeing up, even if it's, again, if it's just an extra 30, 40, $50 a month, we have 30, 40, $50, $50 more a month coming into our accounts than what's going out. We're constantly building those, those uh, accounts and, and we, we won't have to worry about, about overdrafts. All right, overdraft protection. What does it mean to, to, uh, to opt in? Or what does opt-in mean? At one time, uh, fi financial institutions were allowed to give us to 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 give us uh, overdraft protection, uh, and, and they were allowed to just add it to our accounts, and they, they didn't even have to tell us about it. And and uh, and many of the institutions did that. They just you know it was like part of the package. Okay, we're you're going to get overdraft protection, and they would just give it to us. Of course, they didn't tell us that there was a fee that came along with that. You know, pay we had to we have to pay for overdraft protection, but they would just automatically opt us into it. Uh, somewhere back, somewhere between 2010 and 2013, the Fed said, "No, no, you can't do that anymore. The customer has to opt in for overdraft protection if they if they deem they need it or want it." And again, for some people, living paycheck to paycheck may be a good option but um, have to opt in. So they made that change. And now, so now you have to opt in to over, that overdraft protection if you, if you need it or, or want it. That said, um, if, if, if it's like my large regional bank, I, I had to go in, I had to change some, so I actually opened a new account with, uh, with, my, with my large regional bank. And the person I sat down with did everything he could to get me to take overdraft protection. He, you know, kind of, he went on and on and on about how it can protect me and this and that. And at first, when he mentioned overdraft protection, I said, oh, okay, great. Is that included? He, well, no, you have, you have to pay a fee for that. Oh, okay. Well, then I don't need it. <laughs> and he just uh, hammered that, uh, you know. So you, and, and, and the reason I'm saying this is that you, you, you may, be, you, depending on your institution, again, it might be different from, institution, institution, depending on your institution, they might try to hardball you into, into taking overdraft protection, whether you really need it or not. So just uh, be beware, so to speak. So, but overdraft protection, you know, the obviously covers if we, if we do have an overdraft, we can connect to other accounts, the money can be transferred to cover uh, the shortage, they could issue us a line of credit. Also, if uh, say we're, we're, we're a good customer, this is like a once in a blue moon type of thing that happens. Uh, we may be able to request a refund on, on that overdraft fee if that should happen. If you make mistakes, there's fees for overdrafts from the bank and, and others. You know, I, I mail that, uh, again, I still do the old fashioned checks. I mail the check out to whoever's getting it. They're paying people to, uh, to open that check, to process the check and do what they need to do. I mean, there's, there's cost involved on, on that end. So I may get some type of a charge from my institution and a charge from the person I sent that check to. It can and, and does get reported to a check verification service and your account can be closed. If this happens uh, often enough, if this is just running rampant with me, I'm constantly, uh, you know, going over, you know, over uh, with the overdrafts. My accounts good, can be closed, and I could be reported to check systems, which is like the overseers uh, for for this for this industry. And I, in a sense, I could get blackballed for being able to open at least a normal account. And we'll talk about. Uh, we'll, I'll explain what I mean on the next slide. Check systems, um, you know, you, consumer report, you can get a copy of your consumer report through them. And, and uh, one of the things that you can look at, I can either go onto their website at consumerdebit.com, call their toll-free number, and you can copy, order a copy of your consumer report from them once a year, or you can reach out to them if something like this happens. 
you know, I can get a copy once a year just to look into it. Or if something like this happens, I can reach out to them and, uh, and, and, uh, and see, hey, I just got my, my bank uh, closed my account and uh, they're told me I, I'm not a good customer and, and look, and maybe there's some was there was some type of a mistake that was made that needs to be corrected and they can correct that so I may go back out and open an account again. But if not, if it was deemed to be my fault, and I'm just not being a good customer again, I could have accounts closed. Now, that said, there are institutions that will offer second chance accounts. It's uh, it's a limited account. Uh, savings account, limited account, limited use. You may only be, a, be able to allow to use a, a debit card for transactions, but you, you, there are, you know, again, second chance accounts out there. The, now, the good thing about that, I do find an institution that offers that, even though it's very limited, it's usually for a short period of time. I prove that I'm, I'm going to, you know, I can, I do, I'm doing what I need to do, and I can graduate back to a, a normal traditional account. Now, this whole process may require some type of financial literacy class, like a budgeting class. And if anybody is having issues with that, you know, rather than, uh, you know, doing it this way, it may be good to look into some type of a, you know, a budgeting class or, or spending plans, which is basically the same thing, you know, to, to uh, which, which would be a good thing anyway, for, for, uh, for at least some of us. All right, how is your money protected? FDIC and NCUA in, insurance. You know, we, we've, uh, we've, we've heard some things lately in the news with, with, uh, uh, with banks, uh, uh, you know, financial institutions having some issues. Bottom line, as long as our institution is insured, and again, not all of them are, may, you know, may be good just to check. You know, with our our current institution, make sure that our money is is insured. But assuming that our institution uh, is insured through banks, we are FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, right? FDIC insured up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars through credit unions. We are NCUA, which stands for National Credit Union Administration. We are NCUA insured up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars. We are insured up to $250,000 per depositor at each institution. What does that mean? That means if I go, if I, uh, I have an account with ABC Bank, I'm insured up to $250,000 at that, at that institution. I walk down the street to XYZ Credit Union or XYZ Bank, and I open up an account, and I put money into that account or into those accounts, I'm insured with XYZ institution up to $250,000, $500,000 total. So each institution and per depositor, meaning say I open a, a joint account, me and Mark open a joint account at a local bank, right, Mark? <laughs> yeah, we, we open a joint account. Mark's saying that'll never happen. Um, we open a joint account and we are both insured up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars, or two or five hundred thousand uh, dollars total. So two hundred fifty thousand dollars per depositor at each institution. Also, when we're talking about our, our, as I mentioned earlier, as we're talking about our money being insured, we're talking about what's classified as our savings accounts, right? S savings, checking, money market, the holiday fund, vacation fund. Uh, the, you know, the CD certificates of deposit, the, our savings accounts. If we're looking at investing, if I, I have an account with ABC Bank and, and I sit in, in, their, in the savings end and I want to start investing and I go to, I go to their investment branch, you know, ABC Investments, that money that I'm putting in, into those investments are not insured. Money that we're investing is not insured, only what's classified as our, our savings. All right, did you know that FDIC or NCOA, NC, easy for me to say, FDIC or NCUA insurance only covers deposit, and we, we've just talked about this, with uh, deposit accounts, checking, savings, certificates, deposit, money market accounts. If you have funds in anything other than deposit accounts, they may not be insured, as we just talked about. 
Many institutions, virtual or traditional, have investment arms and may offer wealth building or brokerage accounts, just like our big box investment companies. Be sure you understand the type of accounts you are opening. You know, are you, are you saving or investing? Before you open a, a, an account, investigate, verify the firm is licensed. You know, you need to be licensed. You know, licensed is, and legit, as I call it. Um, understand the investments that are offered. Review the relationship summary. Ask questions of your professional. Choosing a professional. Look online, uh, ask for, you know, ask for referrals, ask family, friends, people, you know, maybe people that I work with down at, you know, I could down at the local library, uh, uh, you know, uh, organizations I belong to, uh, verify their license, make, again, make sure that person is licensed and legit uh, before we do anything. When we, a lot of times we see these scammers, these so-called financial professionals, that offer these, these, these great investment opportunities that turn out to be scams. Uh, most, if not all of the time, these people are, aren't licensed. They, they either never had a license or, or they lost their license and they need to do something to make money. And they're, they're, they're running this, this scam, if you will. So verify their license, ask questions, review the form CRS, which is just a, a one-page form on the financial professional gives you a lot of information about that person. Interview or ask questions of the professional that you're, you're, that's assisting you, that you're working with. How long has your firm been in business? How, how do you and your firm get paid? Um, you know, those two things can be important, especially like a finance, uh, you know, like a fine. I worked with a financial professional one time. Uh, we sat down, she worked for what I'll call a big box uh, investment company. And she came to my home, we sat down, we chatted. In our conversation, I found out prior to, to coming to this uh, to, to uh, big box investment company to work as a financial professional, she was in retail. No problem on my end. Yeah, I figured she finally got a job in, in her niche, you know, what she wanted to do, so on and so forth. Um, we chatted. She gave me information. I said, I'll be in touch. A uh, couple months later, I think it might have been two months later, I reached out to her to say, hey, I want, I want to start working with you and so on and so forth. She had already moved on. She had already moved on to another, another job, another industry. So that can be important. How long have they been around? How, you know, how long do they plan to be around? And that could be the other end of it. Uh, how do you and your firm get paid? Different uh, companies, different financial professionals, different companies get paid different ways. Do I, am I charged a fee every time I sit down with you? Am I charged uh, like a regular monthly fee? Do I get charged fees based on transactions that you do for me? So that could be important. Are all investments registered properly? Again, the, the, the investments that I'm, that I'm, I'm looking to do. They might not all be registered, registered properly. There was a gentleman who was a financial professional in the Philadelphia area that we were investigating, and we found out that some of the securities that he, you know, the investments he was dealing with were kind, were very iffy and probably weren't registered. He was issued a cease and desist on those uh, on those securities and issued a hefty fine for it. What types of products do you offer clients and what fees can I expect to pay? Okay. Other questions, what training or experience do you have? Uh, again, you know, what's your background? How, how long have you been, ha, has this person been doing this? Tell me about your other clients. What is your background? What fee, and again, th those fees, what fees, what types of, how do you charge those fees? How, or at base, or more importantly, how am I paying those fees? Broker Check is a site that you can use to check out financial professionals and companies. This is their website, www.brokercheck.finra.org, overseen by FINRA, uh, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. You can go to this site and check out financial professionals, companies. Again, first of all, make sure they are licensed and legit. Uh, Maybe I, you know, I live in the Phoenixville area. I want to find somebody that's local to work with so I can, I can see 
who who in the who is in who's in the area that I could work with locally? Do I have a choice? Are there multiple people? I can check their background. I can see how long they've been doing this. So I can see if they have any complaints against them. A lot of good information that you can find out about fi financial professionals by going to brokercheck.finra.org. All right. Again, the well, not again, but the Pennsylvania Department of Banking and, and Securities, our agency regulates those industries in the Commonwealth. If anyone ever has a question, a problem, an issue, a complaint, as it relates to that, they can reach out to us. We uh, say, say I'm having an issue with my local bank that's not getting resolved and I need to have that issue resolved. Reach out to us. We'll, we'll help you get that issue resolved. Um, say there's a, a somebody a, a financial uh, a fin I, nobody can see me. I'm doing Mark. I'm doing financial professionals with the finger quotes. You know, there's a financial professional, uh, you know, down the street or in the next town that has this great investment opportunity that I think is just a scam they're trying to run, and I want to report them to somebody. Report them to us. You can reach out. We have an in-house staff that will take phone calls Monday through Friday from eight to five normal business hours. You call during those days and times, you should get a live voice answering the phone. If you don't get a live voice answering the phone, you leave a message and somebody should get back to you within 24 business hours. I stress business hours because if you call after five o'clock on a Friday, don't expect to get a, a call back until sometime after eight o'clock Monday morning. But within 24 business hours, we should get back to you. Uh, our, 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 our service is free. There's no charge for our service. We're not trying to sell anything, you know, um, and you can certainly reach out to us. We'll help. And if you reach out to us and it, it's, uh, you've called the wrong place, we will certainly point you in the right direction. If you called the wrong agency, we'll certainly point you in the direction of the right agency that you need to speak to. Toll-free number, 800-PA-BANKS, or you can reach us through our website at dobbs.pa.gov. And check out our website. A lot of good information for consumers on under our Consumers tab on our, our website. Information related to what we regulate, the, the industries we regulate. Basically, information on saving, investing, and protecting what you save and invest. All right, common complaints. When people reach out to us and they want to complain, common complaints, um, deposit holds or fund availability. We talked about that before. You know, we've, 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 people call, you know, I don't like to, my bank won't, uh, I put money in my bank and they won't let me touch that money for, you know, five business days. Yeah, that's, that's how they operate. Yeah, well, I don't like that. I want to be, well, you know, that's, and again, disclosures. By the way, the thing about disclosures, and um, we we will get uh, again, we get complaints about banks on a regular basis. From what I was told from our in-house staff, something like ninety-five percent of complaints about financial institutions are ruled in the institution's favor, and it mainly comes down to reading those disclosures. Again, if we're not familiar with how our institution operates. Get a copy of their disclosure. They should have them available at branch. If you have a, if you're with a brick and mortar brand, uh, bank or or credit union savings bank, they should have them there. They should they should be available somehow. They can get a copy of that and review it. And if you're not happy with uh, you know like fund availability or or other things, you know fees that they charge, you we could certainly that's maybe an, again why we and one of the reasons for this presentation is where we can shop around just like with anything else, and, and look at, at what better fits our needs as far as what we're, we're, we're looking for. So you read those disclosures, but there, there, that's a common one with the fund availability. But again, that's how, that's how that particular, particular institution operates. Same thing with account fees. You know, I don't like the fact that my, my, my bank is charging me fees for everything and all the, well, again, that's how, that's how they, they, they operate. Uh, look around, you know, check those disclosures, check disclosures, because they, they should, those disclosures should be available not only for, for uh, current customers, but potential customers. So I can, I can look and I can go to several, you know, different institutions, get copies of their disclosures 
and compare apples to apples, oranges to oranges. Unauthorized debit or credit transactions and victim of a scam or ID theft. And I'm, I'm going to put that all under scam or ID theft. Something like that happens. We have people calling, complaining about that. Uh, in, in some respects, nothing we can do about it directly, but we can certainly point you in the right direction to report identity theft uh, what, and, and what to do. Basically, what to do, who to reach out to, entities to reach out to, to in, in some cases to close accounts, but to report identity theft and to start a recovery process. And unlicensed lending, aka what I call loan sharking, uh, as the old term goes, if, if somebody's not licensed, they're probably, yeah, they're doing it illegally. And, and uh, that's probably where we see those, uh, you know, you, you loan, you, you borrow a hundred dollars and you owe a thousand the following week. So, all right. Now our agency uh, regulates banks, credit unions, and savings banks in the Commonwealth. However, we regulate uh, either 159, the number is either 159 or 160, 159 or 160 uh, uh, um, yeah, <laughs> um, uh, banks, 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 credit unions, savings banks in the Commonwealth, but not all banks, credit unions, and, and savings banks. Uh, state chartered, that was the two words I was trying to think of. We regulate uh, either uh, roughly 160 state chartered banks, credit unions, and savings banks in the Commonwealth, but not all. Uh, the other, the other uh, institutions that we don't regulate are regulated at the federal level. Uh, federal with federal, the, the you know federal banks and, and credit unions. So for the uh, the ones that are chartered chartered federally, banks and savings, we have helpwithmybank.gov or their toll free number 800-613-6743. For credit unions, we we would do that through the NCUA. Uh, ncua.gov toll free number is 800-755-7030 other federal resources the consumer financial protection bureau a lot of good and we didn't talk about them but a lot of good information on on their website at consumerfinance.gov you can also reach them at 855-411-2372 the federal De deposit insurance corporation uh if you have more concerns about the, how safe your, your, your funds are, certainly reach out to them, fdic.gov or 877-275-3342. The Federal Reserve Bank at federalreserveconsumerhelp.gov uh, or 888-651-1920. Investor Resources, the Securities and Exchange Commission. We can also look up financial professionals and companies through the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, website at investor.gov. Good information on their site as well. 800-732-0330. The North American Securities Administrators Association. We didn't talk about them, but a lot of good information on their website as well at uh, nasa.org uh, slash investor dash education. And FINRA's broker check, which we've already talked about, www.brokercheck.finra.org or 800-289-9999. Questions, and here is my contact information for anybody who would like to reach out to me. Uh, and with that, we, uh, we will end the presentation. We can uh, stop the recording.